Welcome everyone to today's Share Cafe ASX Hidden Gems webinar. Whether you're watching via Zoom, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, I hope you enjoy today's session. The team at Share Cafe have been very busy scouring the ASX this week, and in my view, have uncovered some real hidden gems. Remember, in addition to presenting, the executives also want you to ask questions of them. So fire them through using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Right, let's get started. The first company being showcased today is Neurotech International, ASX code NTI, which has a market cap of approximately $42 million. Neurotech is a medical device and solutions company conducting clinical studies to assess the neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory and neuromodulatory activities of its proprietary cannabis strains. Presenting today is Dr. Alexandra Andrews, Chief Executive Officer. Alex, over to you. Thanks, David. Great to be here. Go to the next slide, please. And the next. So Neurotech is a biopharmaceutical company that is developing these unique um, neurological solutions to treat a whole range of neurological needs that have been largely unmet. We have got exclusive licenses to develop and commercialize proprietary strains of medicinal cannabis. And we've conducted some extensive preclinical studies on these strains. But more excitingly, we have conducted the world's first clinical trial in children with autism spectrum disorder, utilizing our proprietary whole plant strains of medicinal cannabis. We have lodged patents um, across all the major markets. And we have got, as I said, the potential to treat a multitude of neurological diseases um, outside of autism, but we are certainly starting with autism as our primary indication. Next slide, please. Our capital structure. So we have got a uh, share price now at six cents, market cap of 41 mil, and we have 2.3 2, 2 mil cash in the bank. Next slide. Highly experienced board and management team. Brian Leadman, our chairman, has got extensive experience in the biotech sector. Krista Bates, a lawyer and uh, ex-partner at Lavin Legal, where she headed up the medicinal cannabis group. Professor Alan Cripps, AO, a highly distinguished academic scientist and um, yeah, fantastic body of knowledge there at Griffith University. Winton Willisey and Mark Davis, who have both got capital market experience and business finance. Next slide, thanks. What makes NTI 164, our lead candidate, different from the rest? Well, firstly, we are not just another medicinal cannabis company. I'm sure you've heard a lot about medicinal cannabis companies, and I can tell you that each of every one that you've heard of before, it's either developing a CBD product or a CBD and THC product. Where we come in and where we're very different and unique is that our product is very rich in these minor cannabinoids. So CBDA is the main component. We've also got other minor cannabinoids like CBDG and CBN, and these are rarer. Because it's a whole plant, it also includes terpenes and flavonoids and other things that come together to create an effect whereby the result is greater than the sum of its parts. This is called the, on the entourage effect, and there's been lots of work done out of Sydney University through the Lambert Initiative that talks about this, um, this entourage effect and the way that it works. So it's a little bit, well, it's very different to if you were just to extract the CBD or the THC out of the actual plant. We are using the whole plant, which has um, a, a different and, and more powerful effect. As I said, we've got a patent, which was, which was lodged in October last year, and we have got the potential to combine our proprietary strains with other blockbuster combination, uh, blockbuster drugs in combination therapies. Next slide, thanks. Our preclinical evidence so far has shown us that we are able to reduce neuroinflammation and increase cell viability, increase energy production in the cell, reduce markers associated with um, neurodegeneration, so things like MS, and what these things are showing us really is that the way that this drug is working is through multiple different mechanisms of action. 
It's very exciting for us. Next slide. So why target autism? Well, autism is incredibly common. I'm sure you know someone with it. It occurs in one in 44 kids in the US. The symptoms of autism include things like difficulty communicating, repetitive um, body movements, um, just trouble socializing and a host of other things. But currently there is little treatment options available for these kids. And the only FDA approved drug is called Risperidone. And that's an antipsychotic with pretty nasty side effects. So commonly um, things like digest digestive issues and weight gain, breast growth in little boys and girls, it's pretty, pretty horrible. And as you, as you can imagine, these kids have already got enough issues. So the other drug they often prescribe is Ritalin, which creates anxiety and trouble sleeping. What parents are left with is the choice to either continue these drugs with the terrible side effects or to take them off. But what we do know about NTI-164 is that it's very safe and well tolerated. We have, uh, we announced our safety data uh, last month and I can talk a little bit more about what our, our trial has shown on the next slide. Let's go to that please. Thanks. So our phase one, two trial is due to complete um, any minute now in the next few weeks. We released the safety component of this, which has shown that it's perfectly safe. No adverse events were noted. And since, since um, well, the trial was designed so that there was including a washout period where these kids would come off the drug once, it, once, it, once the trial had finished. But what happened, and I've never seen this before in my career, is that the parents lobbied the ethics committee at the hospital to say, we don't want to take our kids off this medication. So we had to amend our protocol to allow these kids to stay on the treatment. Now, as I said, we don't know the actual, the actual efficacy data at the moment, but that those findings will be released to us very soon. All we do know is that the parents want their kids to stay on this, on this drug. So next slide, please. Autism is a huge market opportunity for us. It's valued at 2.3 billion. But there are other markets out there which we plan to tackle as well. I'm very excited about the idea of doing an ADHD trial. We've also got multiple sclerosis, cerebral, cerebral palsy, um, where we've done some preclinical work and continue to work around that. And the combination therapies, that's another very exciting area where we can combine our proprietary strains with blockbuster off patent other drugs. Next slide, please. We have lodged our, we lodged our patents in October last year through RAISE. And though we also conducted an international prior art search, which has really confirmed to us that there are no, there's no one else out there doing this, doing the same sorts of things. So that gives us great confidence to move forward and our patents will be um, confirmed in October because that's the way that the patent system works. Next slide, please. Our pathway to commercialization. Well, we are very focused on the pharmaceutical pathway to commercialization. That is involving the FDA, of course, and it, we see this having the, the most potential upside. I mean, just look at the recent acquisition of GW Pharma by Jazz Pharmaceuticals last year for $7.2 billion US. And that was just a CBD product. We believe our product, our lead candidate NTI-164, we see that as being really far superior to just a CBD alone product. So that's exciting. What's also exciting, as I've mentioned, is the, is the idea of doing combination work because that is actually a quicker pathway to market compared to if you were to be developing a brand new drug from scratch. So we got on the 505B2 pathway of the FDA and we see this as having huge potential upside and really expanding on our patents as well. Next slide, please. Neurotech compared to our peers. Well, 
it's quite hard to compare, compare us to our peers because these companies are all doing either CBD or CBD and THC products. But we can we see ourselves as being most aligned with IHL in Canex because they're the only ones doing, to our knowledge, real combination trials with other, um, other drugs. So we see ourselves as doing something similar to that. But um, yeah, as I said, it's quite hard to compare us to peers per se because there's no one else doing what we are doing. Next slide, please. We have got um, a, we've got lots happening in the near to um, medium term future. Uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing the results of these um, phase one, two trial coming out this month. And then we've got our FDA pre IND meeting happening later this year. We've got our phase two, three trial starting next year. I mean, this year. And those results will be finished next year. So it's a, it's a lot going on. We've got a very clear timeline and clear objectives. Next slide, thanks. So to summarize, look, NTI has got, it's got a great board, great management team. We've got a unique product. We've got clinical programs underway and significant near term and long term milestones. So that's, um, that's us in a nutshell. And thanks so much, David, for the opportunity to talk to you and your audience today. Great presentation, Alex. Alex. Um, really enjoyed it. And uh, clearly you're very passionate about not just the, the uh, work that you're doing from a clinical point of view, but also the needs that you're meeting with this drug and the, the people who are being positive, positively impacted from it. So congratulations. Now, in terms of the drug approval, uh, do you have plans to look at Europe uh, and other markets from an, an approval point of view? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We uh, we have got the FDA through through the US is our is our key focus, but certainly the EU, um, China, we are we've got our patients that cover us for all those major markets, and we certainly intend to take them there. And are you seeing? Um, patient-led inquiry in some of those other markets as you said in the US um, while you can't talk to the results as they haven't been announced the the patient feedback is very positive and, and in a lot of cases um, those patient cohorts internationally talk a lot amongst each other are you seeing sort of inbound inquiry from other markets yeah absolutely that's um, one of the interesting things about this area is that compared to a lot of the other um, research areas that you can do clinical trials in. Um, I've never seen so much inbound interest from, from patients, from advocacy groups. It makes, makes recruitment really, really simple. And we've got, we've been inundated by people's, by, by requests from, from big organizations like the Autism Association as well. So um, certainly internationally and locally, we've had lots of inbound interest in, it does make the clinical trial um, recruitment period um, much, much speedier. And, and is the hard balance that, that um, this is a very clear need um, and the people who are impacted by it almost want you to hurry up and, and it's, you can't hurry up, it has to be done properly. You have to follow the steps to make sure that, that when, you, when you get to that point where you can actually sell a product and deliver a product commercially, that you've ticked all the boxes. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's. It's. It's a lot of pressure, to because you've got you're working with people's lives and ch it's children and their parents. So, yeah, it's it's an emotional it's an emotional issue and it's definitely close to a lot of people's hearts. So, there is um, a lot of pressure to get this uh, done in the shortest time possible. And I assume there's there's um, a lot of excitement as well is of, of the positive impact that you are making now, but the positive impact you believe uh, this product and, and others can make uh, to the lives of so many people. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And just to recap the, the milestones coming up, the, the, the flags that investors should be looking for, what are, the, what are the key milestones over the next six to 12 months that investors should focus on? Well, the, the main one is really going to be this, these results that will be out this month. So that's extremely exciting. And then we've got, we've got, our, we've got to be doing some other projects there. So there's 
combination therapies, there's cerebral, pal cerebral palsy, another indication. We've got our pre-IND meeting lined up with the FDA later this year. And we've got our, um, we've got, what, where is it? There's so, there's so many um, amazing milestones that will be coming out over the next six months. And um, yeah, I look forward to, to updating you all and your audiences. Well, investors, investors love news flow. They love positive impact and they yeah. love uh, management that are driven to, to achieve positive impact in such an important way. Alex, congratulations on what you and the team have achieved. We, we look forward excitedly to results and you know we, we don't know what they are, but we do look forward to seeing them drop over the next short period and then following the success of the company as you continue on your journey. So Alex, thanks for your time. Thanks, David, appreciate it, bye. Next, we have Etherstack, ASX code ESK, market cap of $58.8 million thereabouts. Uh, Etherstack specialises in wireless communications technologies for customers in the public safety, defence, utilities and mining industries. Presenting is David Deacon, CEO and Executive Director. David, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, if you could just uh, jump forward to um, slide four, that'd be great. Um, I've put a fair bit more uh, into this deck for people to take a look uh, at a later point. I'm only going to talk uh, briefly to uh, 10 slides. Uh, five, the first five slides will be about um, really who we are and, and the types of markets we're serving and, and some of our technology and uh, you know, some of the signature clients and deals that we have. Um, and then the other five will focus uh, uh, on our financial performance um, uh, over the last few years and, uh, and our growth story. Um, in a nutshell, uh, Etherstack is a, an established uh, technology business that is uh, profitable. Uh, it's growing rapidly. Uh, we're debt free. Uh, and we have a, a, a very uh, strong recurring revenue base, uh, you know, representing 30 or 40% of our uh, overall revenues uh, just being earned before we get out of bed uh, every morning, which is great. Um, the company is uh, twice as large uh, offshore as it is uh, onshore. Uh, we have research and development uh, groups in uh, Manhattan, uh, Reading in the UK, uh, Yokohama in Japan, it's been established there for 15 years. Uh, and also uh, our primary R&D group uh, in Chippendale in um, at Sydney uh, Fringes. We specialise uh, in an area of uh, wireless communications called uh, digital land mobile radio or essential uh, mission critical push to talk. Uh, these types of um, radio networks don't really encounter a lot of them in your life, um, but they're pretty essential for um, uh, everything that we do. Um, police, fire, ambulance, security services, uh, defense organizations, uh, electric utilities. Uh, we have a raft of electric utility uh, customers around the world who are clients. Um, so that they sort of form the, the public safety and the utility uh, sector. And we also uh, have um, a, a good exposure to um, the, the resources industry uh, for you know, public safety networks uh, or uh, employee safety networks uh, on uh, you know, large uh, resource projects in terms of you know, lots of uh, automated vehicles moving around and um, other bits and pieces. It's absolutely essential that everyone keeps safe uh, and no one gets uh, hurt. And um, uh, obviously the uh, added benefit of that is, you know, maximizing uptime uh, you know, on resource projects. If we just go to the next slide. Um, so the three sort of groups, that, grouping areas that we work in, the digital land mobile radio industry on the left-hand side is a $20 billion a year market um, dominated by uh, a handful of major players uh, around the world, a couple of uh, North American and, and, and several European, uh, and a number of smaller mid-tier uh, uh, players. This area we have been uh, working in for many years, licensing technology to wireless equipment manufacturers, um, uh, handset and mobile manufacturers in Japan, like uh, Kenwood, uh, Icom, switch, switching vendors uh, in the US, Cisco, uh, defense organizations. And it's really this traditional digital and mobile radio business that you know, is essential for providing the you know, public services that people expect, um, you know, as well as uh, you know, keeping the, the lights on with the electric utilities. Um, you know, that, that is our sort of a, our key growth area that has been propelling our growth uh, and our profitability uh, in recent years. There are two big trends coming along um, you know, that, that will be affecting this market. Uh, the, the middle box um, uh, here is what we call mission critical push to talk or 4G or 5G cellular um, uh, spe specialist uh, devices um, uh, that 
um, you know, governments are hoping that they'll be able to leverage from uh, the 4G, 5G spectrum that they have uh, provided to carriers around the world, such as, you know, the Telstra's, the AT&T's and so on. And that will have an impact in the urban areas. Um, and we also have been for some years working on satellite push to talk solutions with the, the, the dramatic uh, crash in bandwidth price as a result of the uh, Leos and Mios uh, going up there. Uh, we see a, also a, a trend to new products and technology uh, in that area. If we just uh, jump to slide eight, so skip three, three forward to bingo. So this traditional digital and mobile radio network uh, area is extremely conservative. Um, uh, almost all of our revenues here are, are government backed with extremely long uh, support tails. Often these support contracts run for 10 to 15 years. Um, and so if we take a look at uh, clients like Ergon Energy, the, the state uh, energy provider in Queensland, Atco Electric in Alberta and Cap Canada, uh, three of uh, Warren Buffett's um, first energy um, uh, electric utilities, Jersey Central Power and Light, uh, Allegheny Energy, Mon Power. These are all long-term customer, customers of ours who we've, we've sold the initial equipment in, very high margin equipment that's gone in there. And then we've got a very long support tail uh, that goes, as I say, for about 10 to 15 years, uh, typically uh, is a minimum um, uh, going forward. And it's that compound revenue growth of every time we put a new network in the ground, um, we get that extra revenue. I'll, I'll come up to a slide a little bit later um, as we come, come through. And you'll see how that's been able to really uh, smooth out our revenues, uh, drive profitability to ETA stack and really unshackle us from a, from a growth perspective uh, going forward as well. Um, besides uh, uh, electric utilities and, and public safety, um, you know, a raft of different defence organisations and a really a who's who of world's uh, defence and wireless equipment manufacturers. We jump forward to slide 11, which is uh, to three more, two, three. This is um, the, the change that's underway at the moment in the 4G and 5G space. This is uh, an announcement related to an announcement we signed, um, we made with uh, Samsung, um, who are distributing uh, our technology into uh, the carrier market globally. Uh, that, that deal we signed almost two years ago. And then last year, we announced the first lead customer being AT&T, uh, the world's largest telco. Um, that was an eight and a half million US dollar deal. Uh, we account in US dollars and we have a, a 31 of December uh, financial year end. That eight and a half million dollar deal consists of about six million dollars in US dollars in, in licensing, which is a very high margin, uh, as well as um, you know, the first three initial years of support uh, in that initial um, uh, package. But we expect, like all of our other networks in this space, for that support revenue just to continue on and on uh, ad infinitum. And we're working with Samsung uh, on um, uh, quite a number of other carriers at the moment uh, in different stages of, of, of maturity to, to get the next deals done. If we go to the next slide, please, David. So the, the space that we're operating there in, you know, there's an upfront licensing fee of, of circa uh, you know, two to $8 million uh, for each carrier win that we get. There's 60 to 90 carriers uh, that are likely to uptake this uh, technology within the next five years uh, within the OECD countries alone. That's that top left box. Um, there are many more in the bottom right box uh, around the world uh, who will also uh, get this technology. But our primary target in the, uh, in the short to medium term you know, is um, the, the 60 to 90 carriers in, in developed countries uh, with our partners uh, such as Samsung and hopefully uh, new switching partners that uh, we're hoping to, to get on board for the technology. We just jump forward to slide uh, 17. We'll jump into um, um, some of the, uh, the financials. Um, and I'll just say that you know, uh, Etherstack has signed direct deals with both uh, Samsung uh, and AT&T and they're the 18th and the 23rd largest company in the world um, by revenues. Um, so you know, we clearly have some reach and punch uh, to get out and deliver around the world. These are the financial highlights for last year. Um, last year, we had an 81% uh, revenue growth to 8.5 million US dollars, 142% uh, EBITDA growth. Uh, so 2.6 million USD on 8.5 million USD, about a 31% EBITDA margin. We repaid the last of our debt last year. So the company has no external debt, strong balance sheet. We made a net profit after tax uh, of just shy of 2 million Australian dollars or 1.45 USD. And yet again, our year on year, um, you know, recurring revenues continue to increase uh, and had fantastic positive operating cash flow uh, for the fourth year in a row. Let's just jump to the next slide. 
Um, that was uh, you know, just, these are sort of the, the we, we entered the year with a fantastic solid pipeline uh, for this year and next year. You see some of the quality of the organisations that we're working with there, UK Ministry of Defence, Australian Department of Defence, Home Affairs here. Um, if we move to the next slide, okay. You can see that in the last four years that uh, you know, we've been uh, you know, positive operating cash, positive EBITDA, um, and now you know, we're really sort of starting to step up. Next slide along. This is really the, the, the hidden story or, um, or, or the real story of what's going on. Every time we get one of these networks in the ground, we get these recurring revenue support, um, sort of being uh, long-term uh, recurring rev support revenues uh, tacked in. So the more networks we've got, the more uh, support revenues uh, that we go. This is extremely high margin um, uh, support revenue. These networks are designed not to stop. You know, once we've got the initial fixed base, in North America, in Europe and Asia to provide that 24 seven support, all new networks and the support related to it drops directly to the bottom line. You'll also see that we have other recurring revenues. That's the blue part of the box, which are um, royalties that other companies uh, pay us when they produce products with uh, our technology uh, in them. Sometimes they're a little bit lumpy to, due to um, minimum volume guarantees, but uh, overall the, the trend is uh, you know, continuing upwards quite significantly. We would expect to see quite a jump in this recurring support revenue in 2023, uh, when the AT&T support revenue, which is estimated to be approximately 850,000 USD, uh, kicks in at that period point in time. Okay, one more slide and then we'll, I'll, I'll throw the floor open to any questions. That's um, uh, just the, uh, the look at the um, uh, you know, revenue and, and gross margin, about 70% across the board. If we just leave it on slide 29, thanks, David. Um, uh, I'll, this, I'll answer some questions. One more, I think. Uh, two more. One more. One more. Bingo. Okay, great. Um, thanks, David. Uh, how you can we? A, a great presentation. I, I've got a question. So you play in a, a global space, um, and and some would say you know, a small Australian company playing in a global space and taking on these much larger players in the wireless communication space. How are you able to compete and win? Oh, look, it's uh, all the usual ways that people uh, win and compete, which is by providing a better product, uh, superior support, uh, and, you know, at a, at a much better, uh, you, know, uh, you know, cost benefit uh, for the end customer at the end of the day. You know, the biggest barrier to getting into the market um, is it's just such a conservative market. Um, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, before they gave us uh, our first network order, had only purchased public safety radio networks from two major vendors um, besides us uh, in the previous 30 years. Um, so when you sort of crack, um, you know, one federal policing agency in Canada, that makes it easier to do the state, you know, the drug enforcement agency, the state department in the US, um, you know, it's a, you know, it's very much win reputation uh, and then ensuring that we deliver. And I suppose that conservatism is hard to crack into, but once you're in, you're embedded and can be embedded for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a very, very difficult space to, to get into. Uh, but these types of networks that they put in the ground, you know, as I say, typically have a lifespan of uh, 15 plus years. Uh, so you know, they're big infrastructure projects like Ergon Energies in Queensland. That's 126 tower sites, uh, and microwave linking six sections across uh, all of Queensland just to host um, you know, our technology inside these repeater sites and the core network site. Uh, you know, once you capture those clients, um, you know, you, 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 that's why those recurring support revenues are not falling away uh, and just continuing to grow. Um, you know, twenty-eight percent compound average growth rate over the past seven years. So, a good question here from the audience, um, and they're all good questions, by the way. Um, how does the sales process work? So, and I know it must differ from one organisation to another, but can you step us through the sort of gestation period and and how the process works? And is it tender? Is it knocking on doors? Is it a mixture Absolutely. of everything? Yeah, no, very, very good question. Um, the, the, the process for, for government radio networks is a, a typical uh, a bid process, RFIs, RFTs, uh, evaluation, uh, and they're often 18, 24 month uh, processes. So 
uh, things that we're working on today, we know won't get awarded for uh, another two years time from, from now uh, in, those, uh, in those sectors. And so we've got a combination of growth for, from adding growth onto the existing networks that we have, plus we're winning more networks, um, and then wins beget wins from a reputational perspective. We also then have uh, two other faster trends uh, occurring. Uh, one is um, in the uh, utilities uh, and in the resources sector, uh, where they uh, move somewhat uh, faster than in a more commercial manner uh, than some of the public safety agencies going forward. Um, so we've got our first uh, uh, Pilbara win um, in May 2020, I think it was, uh, for a major iron ore uh, 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 provider. Um, we're now six awards later, uh, totaling $2.3 million um, you know, in uh, almost exactly two years. Um, and then besides that equipment we're shipping, we're obviously also then going to get the 15 to 20% per annum pull through revenue, compound growth going on on new wins that we get in the ground, um, you know, as well as the, the recurring revenue that comes through. So um, the, the shortest wins um, really are six to nine months. Um, it's just a, it's a conservative industry. These are big infrastructure projects, um, but, you know, we're delivering our customers like the product and they're coming back for more. From once you're in, you're in. So... Um, like you say, it, it, it positively impacts your compounding revenue. Um, and I suppose another part of that question is, so you've got an understanding of your pipeline, you can see it out 9, 12, 24 months. Do you have a, do you have a, a feel now based on, on the history you've created of, we know what's in our pipeline, therefore we know X percent roughly is what we'll probably get? Uh, yeah, look, look, certainly. And, um, you know, I, I think we're very com confident with the existing growth that we have from our traditional digital and mobile radio business. But this new 5G MCX or mission critical switch uh, push to talk space, you know, this is where we've now got Samsung out acting effectively as a Salesforce multiplier for us uh, in that, you know, they've got people talking to 100 telcos around the world. Uh, as they're trying to put in their 5G technology into those carriers. At the same time, they're trying to put in that 5G technology in their carriers. They're pulling through uh, our new uh, mission critical technology, push to talk technology for public safety uh, for agencies that those carriers um, uh, serve. So that initial win last year of eight and a half million USD, uh, we're certainly hoping to see uh, Samsung uh, and other um, uh, future partners uh, replicate that win rate uh, up quite substantially and quite quickly. Great presentation. I will leave you with uh, one last question from the floor. And what are the key messages you'd like to leave us all with? Uh, look, it's, um, we're a profitable, debt-free, uh, growing uh, Australian technology company. Um, we have uh, you know, fantastic uh, you know, uh, accounts, you know, uh, you know, uh, reads like a who's who of the world's um, you know, technology players and defence and public safety agencies. Um, you know, I think it's just a really exciting time uh, for EtherStack going forward and that recurring revenue at the end of the day, that's really what's setting us free from a, a profitability and a positive operating cash perspective. David, a great presentation, working in a, a really interesting space with some big players uh, as your partners and clients. Exciting times ahead. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next presenter is Clive Finkelstein, CEO and Managing Director of RPM Automotive Group, ASX code RPM, which has a market cap of around $52 million. RPM Automotive engages in the manufacture, wholesale distribution and retail of tyres and parts and accessories for the transport industry in Australia. Clive, over to you. Thank you, David. And uh, good day to everybody and a special welcome to all of those of you who are being introduced to the RPM group for the first time. Um, just like to talk about the company for a little while um, and moving on, we'll um, basically the RPM automotive group is a leading player in the in the automotive uh, aftermarket sector. Next slide, please. Um, RPM has a national footprint. We are involved in manufacturing, importing, wholesale distribution um, of a wide range of automotive parts and accessories, including um, tires on uh, passenger, um, commercial and industrial. Let's move on. Um, there are a number of favorable um, uh, in industry fundamentals. Obviously, we're, we're in a quite a large industry. Um, 
automotive sector is, is enormous. Um, we've recently invested further in the four-wheel drive space. Um, we have a vertically integrated business, as I mentioned earlier, whereby we design, manufacture, wholesale. We, we do have, we do wholesale uh, or we sell to our retail businesses as well. So as our retail platform grows, so our um, wholesale business obviously um, benefits. Um, we have a number of leading brands. We're, um, we're very well known in the racing fraternity, um, motorsport being the, um, the showpiece, if you like, of the automotive industry. Um, yeah, as we said, we, we, we have diversified businesses. We're across multiple areas. I'm gonna get into more detail on this later. So I'm not gonna read everything. I know all of you can read and at any time, you can always download this um, presentation and get all the detail you need. Um, Experience Board, myself and, and the guys around me have been in the automotive industry for 25 plus years. We understand it well. We understand the space we play in and um, we've been doing it for some time now. And uh, we have a clear growth strategy. We understand where the opportunities are. We're specifically in what we call sunrise sectors of the automotive industry and um, we are looking to expand all the time both organic and acquisitional growth let's move to the next slide please so our business is built on four pillars as we like to say uh, wheels and tires which is a wholesale tire business we have a number of um, warehouses around australia we import um, wholesale and distribute uh, tires out of those different um, warehouses. We specifically, we, we are well, specialized, if you like, in commercial and industrial tires, commercial being truck and bus and uh, industrial being um, off-road tires or uh, mining, agriculture, forestry, and heavy earth moving equipment. We also do a range of uh, passenger and four-wheel drive tires as well. Um, we then have our retail division, which we call repairs and roadside. Repairs and roadside is basically B2B or B2 fleet retail tire, commercial and industrial tire centers. So um, we would fit or, or, or service fleets of trucks or, or trucking companies with um, new tires and wheels. Um, our motorsport business is a market leader in the space. We do, um, uh, we own our own brand. That's where the, the RPM brand comes from. We're actually the only FIA approved uh, race suit manufacturer in Australia. So we do custom suits for uh, a number of the top racing car drivers, as well as anyone who uh, would like to have their own uh, um, race suit that uh, is designed for them. And finally, we have our performance and accessories division, which is um, uh, both manufacturing, wholesale and retail. We have uh, all kinds of accessories um, that we sell through that, that division, as well as a platform um, of a franchise group that we have um, as the distribution platform. Next slide, please. Um, just a few key uh, uh, salient details, if you like, on the market and the opportunities. The Australian automotive parts and maintenance sector represents about $34 billion in annual revenue. Um, the sector is highly fragmented and RPM has a strong track record of driving consolidation, but um, the, the sector is consolidating, so it is a good time for that. Um, RPM has a vertically integrated business model with uh, increased operating leverage to drive earnings growth. And uh, quite recently, we've we acquired a business that uh, has greater design capabilities, which we will use in other manufacturing um, uh, businesses, both internal and external. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, we have a basic acquisition uh, strategy. We have 
we basically buy businesses on, on a formula. Um, I won't go into too much detail of, of the formula. It's all there for anyone to see, but pretty much we, we, we try and identify the correct businesses in the right areas and, um, and apply our formula. Just to give you an, an, an understanding in uh, FY22, so this current year we've completed eight acquisitions, building on five done in the previous year. Um, we've had significant growth, both uh, organic and acquisition or inorganic. Um, and uh, yeah, we have many opportunities uh, to unlock even further uh, synergies. Next slide, please. Just a quick timeline of different businesses that we've, uh, we've acquired this year and some investments we've done. Um, in other words, either green fields or just expansion on businesses. I think we can move to the next slide. Some of the highlights, um, FY22 highlights, we've had record growth in revenue and EBITDA, uh, eight strategic acquisitions to complement businesses that will deliver meaningful cost and revenue synergies. Our businesses are quite similar, so there are a number of synergies that we, we achieve um, as we bolt them on. Um, and strong investment strategy to support rapid growth. Just some guidance that we've been able to provide. Uh, FY22 revenue target, uh, targets of in excess of $80 million and uh, EBITDA targets in excess of $7.2 million. Um, we've had 18.5% organic growth this year. Um, and um, yeah, if you annualize our turnover run rate currently, we're sitting um, a little over $120 million. The outlook for FY23, um, we, yeah, we're looking to consolidate a number of acquisitions that we've recently done, just get them down and, and, and ensure that we get the value out of them, whether it be through the cross-selling opportunities that we have both in the OEM and aftermarket sectors or in um, transferring products through different distribution channels. Um, further growth opportunities to continue the, the, the company's expansion strategy, a focus on earnings growth, specifically in the repairs and roadside and performance and accessories divisions that we've achieved through economies of scale. So, so the two areas that we focus on, are, are focusing our growth on is in that retail tire industry, as well as our uh, performance and accessories division. Um, further improvements in trading conditions as COVID-19 restriction ease and, and activities increases. Our, our retail businesses were hurt in Q1 of this year as a result of um, pretty much Metro Melbourne and, and uh, Metro Sydney being shut down. But um, uh, as the years progressed, obviously they've, they've recovered quite nicely. Um, and finally, uh, continued implementation of best practice management in inventory and supply chain. Our, our business is, is heavy on stock. And um, yeah, we, we do a lot of importing and, um, and distribution. And as a result, um, we need to have the stock when our customers need it. Next slide, please. Um, that pretty much comes to the end. There are some more slides after this, which um, you guys can go through, uh, giving a little bit more detail on the business and the shareholding and the directors. But um, I think that pretty much sums up or gives you a good overview of exactly what the RPM group is. Um, yeah, thanks, Clive. Great presentation. There uh, are a number of questions coming through. I always love it when uh, a question starts with, hi, Clive, I love the presentation. So uh, that's a big tick from the audience. Um, one question is, is around market share, do you have an idea what your, your current market share looks like and therefore what the growth opportunity is? Okay, so we're in a number of sectors. So I'll, I'll give you the, the key sector for us is, is uh, commercial and industrial tires. Commercial and industrial tires, the, the, the um, industry is in excess of $2 billion. Um, to give you an idea, we, um, our current wholesale value in that space is 
in and around the $45 million range. So um, we got a long way to go. To be fair though, we, we play in a, a particular sandpit in that industry. So uh, that industry is divided into tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier, tier one would be all the brands that everybody knows, you know, the, 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 the well-known brands. The tier three is Chinese brands and we, we play in that space. Um, when we got involved in 2016, the, the industry, the, the commercial industry was about 800 million and about 20% of that was, was uh, taken up by the Chinese manufacturers. It's now about 1.2 billion and about 35% of the space is, is uh, taken up by Chinese manufacturers. So, so our, our industry is growing, but our, high, our, our portion of the industry is growing even faster. So we believe that there's plenty of opportunity for growth there. That was the point I was going to make, that uh, you're a, a well-established brand in a growing industry. Uh, so the opportunity there is significant across all the different business units that you have at your disposal. Yes. Um, um, it, it just just to, to digress, one of our other companies, um, Revolution Race Gear, is the market leader in its space. So it has in excess of 35% of, of, of um, the market share. So um, yeah, you've got two very different um, businesses there, but uh, as the market leader, all we do is we look to increase the range or the products that we can sell. I like to say more lines on an invoice effectively, same customers just offering them more product. And in terms of M&A, do you have a capacity or is there always the ability to either self fund or bring in funding for the right M and A? Um, we have a formula that we buy on, and the formula is based on how we get our funding, as well as an earnout strategy, so that um, uh, we we have the key stakeholders invested. We like to take them along. We. We believe in cultural fit. We we very very people focused, so we we think that people make businesses. As a result, it doesn't make sense to buy a business um, and then eliminate the the drivers or the or the champions of that business because uh, generally the business goes with them. We've we've been on that side of the of the table in the past, and uh, we understand that, and we understand how uh, guys who may own a business that might be too big to be small and too small to be big caught in that funny zone how it's quite hard for them to integrate into a bigger organization so we we help them with a transition and when you bring a business in there's obviously the financial there's the people piece but do you find that inside your organization the organic growth that comes from those businesses uh, is much superior to what they would have achieved in their singular form Oh, absolutely. So in, in most of our businesses, we, we supply, our wholesale businesses supply our retail businesses. So if we buy a business that is already a customer of ours, for instance, we'd sell more product to them. They'd make more margin out of the product they're buying from us. And we'd offer them, we'd, we'd, we'd cross pollinate their customer base. So, and added to that, when we set up, businesses we like to um we like the vendor to participate in the value we bring so effectively if we can make the business make more money we give the vendor the opportunity to actually um uh participate in that so super profit performance bonuses understood um now just to recap for people through your growth strategy what are the divisions you're focusing on from a growth perspective and why so we call the one division repairs and roadside. A better explanation is just um, our retail tire division, which is B2B or B2 fleet. Our reason for it is coverage. We, we want to look after our customers better. Our customers who are generally transportation uh, industry people um, would have depots in multiple locations. They'd be using multiple service providers. We want to make their lives easier by offering them them service more on a on a more national level. 
that's the one business, one division that we've been focusing on. The other one is the performance and accessories division. Um, I said that we joined the Thai industry in 19, 19, uh, 2016. We've been in the accessories industry since 1996. We understand that very, very well. Um, it's, we've, we've seen unprecedented growth in that space over the last three or four or five or 10 years, probably um, uh, given a shot in the arm by COVID-19, no question about that. However, we don't see that, that ending. We've, we've invested recently quite heavily in the OEM side of that industry. Um, one of the businesses we, we um, acquired is a, an, a supplier to caravan and camper trailer manufacturers. We've recently invested in another business that um, caters to the aftermarket. We believe that we can cross-pollinate both of those product ranges. And uh, we've already begun um, with the one and have seen some very, very um, favorable results. Clive, a great presentation, a really interesting company and a true hidden gem, a company to watch. We look forward to watching your success, financially uh, a well-established and very stable company. So congratulations on pulling all of those things together. Fantastic presentation, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, David. Last but by no means least is Metalhawk, ASX code MHK, which has a market cap of around $11 million. Metalhawk is a West Australian mineral, mineral exploration company focused on early stage discovery of gold and nickel sulphides. Presenting is Will Belbin, Managing Director. Will, over to you. Thanks, David. Thanks for joining the webinar. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of Metalhawk, I'd provide you a, um, a quick intro if you want to um, move on to the slide number three there's the disclaimer um, so we're a west australian junior explorer we're focused on um, making new discoveries of nickel sulfide and gold um, in wa it's the best place um, in australia if not the world to be exploring for these metals um, we have a number of um, high quality assets and projects in the state uh, we have a strong pipeline of activity uh, with imminent and pending news flow over the next six to 18 months. Um, we have made recent high grade nickel sulfide and gold discoveries on, on our ground, which I'll be um, talking about. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So our projects are located in the um, gold fields, um, the Kalgoorlie region, also further south in the Albany, Fraser and Norseman regions. We do have um, a couple of um, joint ventures um, spanning um, across four of our projects. We have a, um, a JV with Western Areas, which is soon to be IGO, or known as Independence Group. Um, and these guys are exploring for nickel sulphide on three of our projects. And we also have an earning agreement with Falcon Metals on the, um, on the Viking Gold project. Um, now, these JVs really enable us as a junior company to focus on our own one or one or two projects at a time, but it also enables the company to put a lot of money into the ground without diluting shareholders. Um, and we do have a, a very expansive portfolio for a, a company of our size. And move on to the next slide, please. So we do have a small team. Uh, we have a low number of shares on issue. Um, we've been listed for about 18 months. Um, we, uh, we're well supported by our JV partners who are major shareholders. Um, and we do provide our shareholders with um, great leverage to exploration success, as you can see from the, the nickel sulphide discovery we, we made in, in September last year. So um, certainly um, hoping to make more of these. Um, you can move on to the next slide, please. So our goldfields projects um, are all located um, ideally within, within an hour from Kalgoorlie. Um, the Bearhaven project is our focus, um, whilst uh, the Emu Lake and Kanauna East projects are part of the Western Areas um, joint venture. Um, and they've been, they've been very active and certainly ramping things up there over, the, over this year. Um, next slide, please. So Bearhaven is only about 20 k's um, east of Kalgoorlie. 
um, we've consolidated over 90 square k's of tenure on this project um, since we acquired nickel rights from Horizon Minerals. Um, early on in the piece, we discovered um, high grade nickel sulphide, which really um, demonstrated the potential of this project uh, and certainly gave us um, confidence to continue on with regional exploration. Um, we have about 10 kilometres of strike to explore these um, ultramafic rocks, which are, are undercover. Um, and certainly high grade nickel sulphide is, is what we're chasing. Um, we're about five k's north of the Blair nickel sulphide uh, mine. That's where the Commodore discovery was made. And we're continued, continuing to explore along this trend, which has um, been very poorly um, poorly explored in the, in the past, um, partly due to the, um, the alteration of the rocks and the, um, and the shallow transported cover. Um, next slide, please. So it was the, only the second RC hole that we drilled on the project that intersected high grade nickel sulphide. Um, it certainly um, set things alight on the, as far as our um, share price, it got a lot, lot of eyes on the stock. Um, 5.9% nickel is, um, is considered very high grade. Um, we followed up um, this with diamond drilling a few months later. Um, the first diamond hole we drilled hit uh, 3.4 metres at over 2% nickel um, and about 50 metres below the nickel sulphide zone, we, uh, we intersected a, a zone of high grade um, gold mineralisation, which was certainly a nice bonus. Um, and we've since um, followed up that gold hit with a, um, with a small diamond program, which we completed only a few weeks ago. Um, next slide, please. So we've received about half of the assays uh, results from this diamond program. Um, and every, each of the holes that um, have returned so far have intersected significant gold mineralization. Um, this, is a, this is a great start um, for this project. Um, and it sort of it shows the continuity of mineralization. I mean, we've hit nearly six meters at 6.7 grams gold in hole one, followed it up with two and a half meters at over seven grams gold, another 1.4 at four. I mean, these are these are great numbers. Um, we'll look forward to reporting the remaining assays when they come through in the next month or two. Um, and then we'll be following up um, with more diamond drilling. Next slide, please. So the Bearhaven project um, is a, a tremendous opportunity for the company. Um, previously on this project, there's been, um, there's been no mapped ultramafics running through the, the western side of the tenements, which you can see here on the yellow, the yellow lines. Uh, the Commodore discovery there in the middle um, has really opened up a significant search space for us. And it's, um, it's proven the geological model that we've applied to this project. Um, historically, um, as explorers have really focused uh, around the margins uh, from Blair, the so-called Blair Nickel Dome. So we've challenged this theory and, and proved successful. So we're, we're continuing to use um, regional geophysics and drilling to, to explore for more nickel sulphide deposits. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, so, our focus, I mean, and our, and our biggest focus is exploring along the strike extensive Commodore Ultramafic unit. Um, and the results um, at Commodore have given us that, that confidence and encouragement. Uh, about one and a half Ks north of Commodore, we've, um, we've advanced a prospect called Tirana, where we've hit some extremely encouraging strong geochemistry in RC drilling. Um, deeply weathered rocks, these sorts of um, values of nickel, copper and PGEs uh, certainly get um, most nickel geologists very excited. So things like 12 metres at over half a percent nickel, high copper and PGEs. So we're currently testing this target at depth with more RC drilling and we'll continue to keep exploring and, and testing the new targets that we've generated from geophysics and, um, and geochemistry. So um, and that's, that's our main focus at Bearhaven. So if you move on to the next slide, I'll tell you a bit about the, um, the joint venture with Western Areas. So um, they are spending, uh, they have the ability to spend $7 million over, um, over five years to earn a 75% um, share in these projects. 25% is free carried to decision to mine. 
it's a good deal for us. Um, we don't have to put our hands in our pockets. Um, and uh, we retain the gold rights on these two um, goldfields projects, Emu Lake and Canal East, um, which is um, Western Area's main focus at the moment. You move on to the next slide. So um, Kanana East is positioned about 10 k south of one of, the, one of the highest grade nickel sulphide deposits in the world in, in Silver Swan. Um, this um, southern ultramafic has had very little work done on it. Uh, Western areas uh, completed their first round of diamond drilling uh, in uh, March, April. They, um, the first hole they drilled intersected over 200 metres with visible um, finely disseminated nickel sulphide. And this is a this is an outstanding result at such an early um, stage. And we look forward to the commence, commencement of diamond drilling um, when they head back there in the, in the next month or so. Um, and um, the, other, the other projects in the Western Areas Joint Venture are, are a little bit earlier stage, but um, they're certainly starting to ramp up their activity in the Joint Venture. If you move on to the next slide. I'll touch on our Norseman projects. Um, we have a big piece of ground um, on the, the Viking um, Gold project, uh, which is part of an earning agreement with Falcon Metals, which is a spin off from um, Chalice Gold Mines. Um, Viking has had some historical, very high grade hits of gold, very shallow mineralization. Um, it, it is pretty light on as far as drilling goes. Um, and these guys are getting ready for their maiden RC program hopefully um, third quarter this year, so not too far away. So we really look forward to that. Um, additionally, we have a, a project just out of Norseman, um, which is highly prospective for high grade gold and also PG, PGE mineralization. Um, both of these projects have only fairly recently be, been granted. Um, so we really look forward to um, activity ramping up um, as over the next 12 months or so. So um, if you, we do have a couple of other, um, couple of other projects in there, but this is just a, a lot going on and, and I don't really have time to talk about it all. Uh, if you move on to the next slide, I can give you a bit of an investment summary. And our shareholders are leveraged to exploration success. We do have a lot of binds in the fire. We've got high quality assets in world-class um, areas and jurisdictions. And that's Western Australia. Um, we have made high grade nickel sulfide and gold discoveries. Um, we're, we're serious explorers. We have a lot of news flow coming up, a lot of, act a lot of activity. Um, we have meaty joint ventures, which enable us to, to continue exploring and putting a lot of money into the ground without diluting shareholders. We're tightly held and we're in a strong financial position. We, we think we're very good value. Um, yeah, that's it, thank you. Thanks, Will. A great presentation. Um, look, I'm always amazed that in a tier one jurisdiction such as WA, companies are still getting their hands on such prospective projects so close to genuine mining centres. Step us back a little bit. How did you actually do it? I guess when we started putting together the assets, um, it was three or four years ago, um, there were opportunities, there still are opportunities. I mean, the goldfield is a, a very prospective, um, large area. Um, it's all about exploring undercover, recognizing opportunities, um, putting together consolidated pieces of ground. Um, uh, the, uh, the tenement holdings in the goldfields is, is quite um, complicated. A lot of the times um, exploration gets overlooked due to the, um, competitive nature of um, land holdings at the time. Um, so it's just about seizing those opportunities and, and being able to um, recognise where the value is. Oh, well, you've definitely seized a, a, a cracking opportunity in the portfolio of assets. Um, for example, Bearhaven project is right next to a previously operating nickel mine and two previous gold mines, um, but it seems to have been left un underexplored. Yeah, we, we think we like to think that we've um, thought outside the box a bit there. Um, I mean, every geology is an interesting subject. Um, rocks behave differently to different methods of geophysics and geochemistry and things like that. But um, 
the the ultramorphic rocks that we're exploring and they're altered um, in a way that they don't have a strong magnetic response. So the aeromagnetic imagery, you, you can't really tell where the ultramorphics are. You need to drill holes. We drilled the right holes in the right place early on. So it's sort of now we're following our nose and and we believe we're onto a, onto a good thing. Is that also partly the advancement of technology means that the work that you can do now is so vastly different to the work that could have been done two, five, ten years ago? Uh, I, I don't think we're doing anything too differently, um, but there certainly are a lot of technological um, improvements. Um, I'd say more in the drilling industry um, and the use of the use of high-powered electromagnetics as well for picking up these massive sulphide deposits. Um, but that has been around for some time. Um, just about making the most of these technologies. Now you've got a joint venture partner, Western Areas, which is obviously in a tussle with IGO, and they're significant holders in the business. Are they are they supportive from a sharing data, sharing knowledge, sharing resources point of view? Uh, I believe they are. Um, IGO are um, very pro exploration at the, at the moment. They're very pro nickel, hence the takeover of Western Areas. Um, uh, most of the team from Western Areas at this stage will be um, will be moving on with the projects, and we've got a good relationship there. Um, we'll find out in the next few weeks, um, but at this stage, it's all it's all happy days, all pretty good. Now, Norseman's sort of hit the map in recent times, thanks to Galileo's recent discovery. Now, there's lots of different mineralisation types through that area, but clearly a lot of underexplored ground and a lot of opportunity in Norseman. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've got, we've got gold targets at Norseman that under lake cover, that under shallow lake cover. Um, that's, one, that's one type of target. That's what we, we first... Um, picked up that ground for. Um, there's also PGE um, potential on the, um, on the Jimbalana dike, which occupies much of the, the tenement. And, and that's the sort of target that Galileo have been um, drilling um, not too far to the west. So um, yeah, we're, we're actually reviewing the, the PGE mineralization and the potential of that project as we speak. Um, certainly following the Galileo story with interest. And, and there's nothing like you know, a, a, a good success to light up a whole area that, that everyone's in the area gets a bit of that, uh, bit of that glow. But it, as you say, it, it can get you to um, re-look at what you may have done or reassess or look back on some of the data points to see, well, look, is there an opportunity here that, that we may not have thought of or may not have seen at the time? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, a, a new discovery, of a new type in a new area is great for the whole industry. And it's, um, you just have to look at the, um, some of the surrounding companies of, of surrounding Galileo. They've all bloody doubled in, in share price since the discovery and it's only very early, early days. Um, so I guess there's a lot of, there's a lot of upside there. And um, yeah, we might, we might be a part of that in, in, on that project. <laughs> but our main focus is obviously nickel at Bearhaven. Yeah, and so zoning back on Metal Hawk, as you say, you've got a strong pipeline of activity. What what are some of the key things that investors should look at for the next three to six months? A good question. Um, we we're going hard on nickel exploration at Bearhaven, so we'll. And it does take there is a lag between lab lab results and, and drilling at the moment. So we're going to have um, the, the samples that we've got in the lab now. We've still got three or four. Or at least three months of, um, of news flow coming out of them. Uh, we're currently drilling now. We've got more programs planned in, in July, August. Um, our JV partners are um, really ramping things up. They'll be diamond drilling out at Kanauna in, in, um, in, um, in July at the latest. Um, and, and the Falcon Metals will be down drilling at, at Viking, hopefully in the second half of this year. I and mean, that's the, the first drilling that's been done down there in, in years. And there's some extremely high grade, really attractive gold targets. So we're really looking forward to that. A busy company, well-funded with great joint venture partners who are very active, uh, all leads to strong news flow, um, activity, 
you know, keeps the market going and keeps the shareholders happy seeing you spending the money in the ground and, and working hard on your projects. A lot of opportunity for exploration success, a low market cap. Will exciting times ahead for Metal Hawk and its shareholders. Look forward to following your progress. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks everyone for joining in. Cheers. Thanks everybody. Well, that brings an end to our presentation today. Four cracking companies, four companies to watch. Keep them on your watch list. Uh, see how they perform and we look forward to catching up with you everybody next week.